Hi there, welcome to Ask the Chiropractor, your source for ultimate health, healing, chiropractic, and medical related information. I'm Dr. Adam Rodnick out of Commerce Township, Michigan, and I'll be your host today. We're here with our co-host, Dr. Alex Rodnick out of Livonia, Michigan, and our special guest, Norman Siddiqui, uh, out of, from U.S. Rehab. Correct, we're welcome. located in Southville. Thank you, welcome. Absolutely. So uh, a couple things, we'll start off by asking you a little bit about um, some old misconceptions. You know, we see here this from a lot of our incoming patients who will say, you know, the doctor told me to do physical therapist, to go to do physical therapy or see a physical therapist, not a chiropractor. Or the doctor told me to go to a chiropractor, not physical therapy. And that physical therapists and chiropractors butt heads with their treatment in general. We don't like you, you don't like us. And the same thing in general with surgeons you know they may not like us and we may not like them but yeah. that's kind of an, a, an older um, myth. myth and misconception you know the new school we can all work together we can all be a piece of the puzzle and if the goal is the betterment of the patient mm -hmm. we should all work together you know in my opinion uh, what I've seen in the past patient who get chiropractor treatment with the physical therapy treatment they have a better outcome than just getting one or the other uh, a lot of time we working with the muscular area of the body, where a chiropractor can do manipula uh, manipulate a lot of bones, the spine, and all the cervical area or lumbar, working with them and doing a physical therapy at the same time. It's a better treatment for the patient because the joint mobility you guys can produce and muscle strengthening and flexibility we can produce. Putting those things together has a better outcome than just going for chiropractor or I'm going to do only chiropractor for first six weeks, then I'm going to try physical therapy or vice versa. Right. And that's what we see a misconception even too with a, a lot of chiropractors out there or a lot of physical therapists that, well, come to me, but while you're coming here, don't go there or vice versa. I see that from people all the time and I, I wholeheartedly disagree with that. It depends on the patient case, but in many instances, we certainly get better results working together mm -hmm. because each joint has so many components around it. There's an osseous component, mm -hmm. which you can even see here on our model, right? Yeah. Here's our spine. There's an osseous or bone component where the joints articulate or connect with each other. Mm -hmm. But there's musculature around. There's uh, a ligamentous component where there's you know anterior longitudinal ligament here, posterior mm -hmm. longitudinal ligament here, and therapy can certainly help to stretch ligaments, strengthen muscles, mm -hmm. help with the rehab, while the adjustments we do can help get mobilization, mm -hmm. take pressure off of the joints themselves. So you know, there's so many times that we're working together at the same time can Correct. be extremely beneficial. And one of the most important things, in my opinion, is communication too. You know, one thing I really try to do with all of our patients is if they're co-managing with interventional pain or orthopedist or physical therapy, I like to try to communicate with those specialists with those physicians with the rehab unit I like to communicate myself so that they know what I'm doing I know what they're doing whether it's from faxing the, the full reports and records to even just calling the doctor or text messaging the doctor you know yeah. with modern technology it's pretty easy we just shoot a quick email this is what I did today you know let me know how what you do helps see communication in the medical field is so hard to get to the doctor you got to go through the <coughs> These six people. The gatekeepers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You got to call the secretary and then call the nurse and then get to the doctor. You can write whatever you want, but who's reading it? That's what I look at it. Communication is the most important component of any rehab or patient care, but we tend to forget. Why? Because we're so busy doing paperwork, doing other things. If we, I, what I have seen, the patient that I've seen who are like, uh, how I want to say. The patient I, that I've seen in the everyday life, if I'm friend with their physician and I can catch them at the weekend party or after hours, if you call, you can communicate about patients. It makes it easier. It really it, does. It does. So it does. That's why, you know, my first few years of my career, I didn't have a lot of relationships with a lot of others, you know, primary care, orthopedists, neurologists, physical therapists, but now I, I'm 10 years into practice and, uh, I have really good relations with a lot of physicians in the Tri-County area, and it really makes it easy if I know the doctor who's treating, instead of my staff, requesting a record from their staff, which may never come through or may take a while. Exactly. If I can just send a text message, exactly. and I save myself notes every day at my lunch, every day when I leave the office, I'm, I'm calling you know, 5, 10, 15 physicians that I had 
shared a patient with that day just to, to follow up with them, let them know what I did. We'll send them the full report. They may or may not always read the full yeah. report, yeah. but it's so easy to communicate mm -hmm. if there's a good network and relationship between a lot of the different specialists. And that a lot of times mm -hmm. is the problem is when there's a breakdown of communication. That's why a lot of times chiropractors or physical therapists, they won't understand what the other specialist is doing and that's why they, if they don't understand it, then they don't like it and then there's that, that breakdown in patient care. And I think a lot of times it's um, where, where the, they're not sure what the other one's doing, they're not sure what's helping. And I, I know a lot of, I've, I've spoken to a few physical therapists mm -hmm. about this and they said that they've actually been taught in, in school to tell pa patients wh while they're going through physical therapy to tell their patients to hold off on chiropractic so they know which thing is helping. And I think that's also a problem too because a lot of times, like you were saying, it works very well hand in hand when mm -hmm. they do them together. Because if you're just lining up the misaligned right. vertebra and there's right. no core strength, the muscles aren't able to hold things, then you're, you're gonna need misaligned. to be adjusted again and again and again. Right. It's not gonna ever hold. And the same goes true on the opposite. If things are misaligned mm -hmm. and the joints aren't moving properly and you're doing the rehab to strengthen exactly. the muscles, they're going to be holding things, but still in the wrong position. Correct. So it, it really does work hand in hand. And it might take longer time to get there, the results you want, mm -hmm. because somebody can adjust their spine while you're working with the muscular structure. It's easier to move on to the next step. Absolutely. I can strengthen the muscle, but muscle strength doesn't show until four to six weeks. And then that old mentality of like, we want to see if what we're doing is helping before you do anything else. It, it seems almost selfish to the point where we want the credit to say that we're helping you. We're, yeah. we're, my goal is to better our patient. And so it doesn't matter if it was you who, yeah, exactly. helping. Who cares as long together, as the patient we gets better? Well, the fact yeah. of ego is always there. Yeah, yeah. I did the best or he doesn't know what he's doing. No different than that. our other if specialists. If you take care of the patient, patient mm -hmm. will go tell 10 other people that I did this. They will be your spokesperson. They will be the one who will tell others how I got better so quick because I was doing all those things. If everybody worked with their ego and their own four walls, they results are not very good. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's move on and talk about a few different things. We'll talk about a, a couple of conditions. I, I know before the show we were talking a little bit about some patients that, uh, that you see and that we see and that a lot of people may not know much about this type of condition. Mm -hmm. uh, one is carpal tunnel. Correct. So it's a big buzzword. A lot of people think a lot of things are a carpal tunnel mm -hmm. that may not necessarily be actually carpal tunnel syndrome. Mm -hmm. So well, let's explain a little bit about what that is, what the condition is, and then things you can do and things we can do to, to help patients with that. Yeah. Carpal tunnel, you know, uh, very simple thing. People always talk about repeated motion, cause problem, inflammation, and in like in the middle of the carpal it's bone. A tunnel here. These are it, carpal it, bones. These are tunnel. And, I don't want to go into anatomy yeah, and bore you with this, but what that is for general population, carpal tunnel is it's like a little tunnel be between the two carpal bones, and there are, it's a very small area, and then you have eight flexor tendon coming through it, then you have a median nerve, and then you have a blood supply, they're all going through it. People doing a lot of rest function, what they're doing, when you do repeated motion, you over strengthening your muscle, because you're always moving those muscles, those muscles tend to get heavier or thicker, like uh, chicken breast. There's a white meat, there's a red meat. The, the re darker area of the chicken breast is like uh, where the uh, wings the, are. The fast motion. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, using they're always moving it, and compared it has to more blood supply and mm -hmm. it gets more thicker and darker. Same with the, all your forearm muscle on the inner side or medial side. These muscles are always doing wrist motion. So these tendons are always working, always busy. Muscle gets more strength than the tunnel is more. What we need, we need, with the strength, we also need flexibility. When these muscles are working too high of a rate, these tendons are tight, they're overworking. A lot of times people see this problem, uh, I have pain in my wrist. And you probably know more than I do that a lot of times it could be issue in the neck. Not necessarily carpal tunnel itself, 
symptom you see, whatever compressive in your neck, whatever going through your brachioplexus, it's a median nerve problem, and median nerve distribute from different part of the cervical area. And they'll just say, hurts here. Hurts That's here, all they think. exactly. And, so, and if someone doesn't know much about musculoskeletal conditions, they may have gone to some doctor or some yes. friend or neighbor of theirs just said, yes. it sounds like you have carpal tunnel, or maybe their primary care said, oh, it sounds like some carpal tunnel symptom. Yeah. But once we do a little more digging, we find out whether mm -hmm. it was a problem with the forms building up so much where the tendons don't have room to go through, yep. or it was irritating from the nerve here, or the nerve going through the elbow, the shoulder, or the root from the exactly. neck. Exactly. And so it's important to do a lot of analysis. We do a lot of orthopedic and neurological testing with all of our new patients. We want to get to the bottom of exactly what's going on, mm -hmm. and more importantly, exactly what we could do to treat it. And as a physical therapist, what I see, when I see these carpal tunnel patients, there are patients, group of people out there, they want to try physical therapy first before they do the other option of surgery. I always try to teach patients. You can always get a surgery as, <laughs> as a second option. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But try this. And what I have seen, because of the area so compressed already, you go there, do the surgery. What it does is inflame the area more. You have now, first, first of all, you have a tight area in the first place. Now you've got a scar tissue sitting there. And then they, they, they did their procedure to release the tendon. All that area in the small area is so much compression. What I have seen in the patient after the surgery, they don't get better. We and I'm not uh, knocking any of the physician out there. We see people had to go through a surgery, then after five years later, surgery. another surgery, yeah. two, three surgeries on it. Yeah, a, so lot of pr a lot of the problem is a mixed diagnosis. Because like you were saying, somebody has wrist pain. That doesn't mean they have carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah. Uh, you know, It could be a lot of different things. And sometimes it's multiple things. People can have more than one problem. We were talking yeah. about a pinched nerve in your neck causing uh, radiculopathy, yeah, and you get that pain down your arm and in the wrist. Yep. Or sometimes we can even have what, what's called a double crush syndrome where the nerve will be getting pinched in your neck and the carpal, carpal bones tunnel, yep. because of swelling and inflammation in the tendons causes pressure pushing down on the, yep. on the median nerve yep. and then you get that, that numbness, tingling, pain shooting into your fingers. So in a chiropractic perspective, we look at taking pressure off the nerve. So whether we're adjusting the spine, the, the spine. neck, or mm -hmm. we're adjusting the carpal bones themselves to open up that space, mm -hmm. we're trying to relieve pressure off the nerves. Well, what you're doing is also gonna be doing the same thing where you're stretching to loosen up those tight tendons. It's gonna decrease the inflammation and allow normal motion mm -hmm. and less pinching on that median nerve as well. And when I see a carpal tunnel patient, uh, my focus mainly is stretching exercise. I do a lot of stretching of the forearm muscle. I do a lot of stretching of all your tendon, in, uh, which involve in the compression of the median nerve or wrist flexors. At the same time, I'm stretching their thoracic area. A lot of time, people have imbalanced, uh, very tight pectoral muscle, forward head syndrome, mm -hmm. or bad posture. I try to stretch them out. Like an upper cross syndrome. Exactly. Right. I started from here and worked my way down. And if you give somebody good four to six weeks, it's not a short-term fix. Therapy goes on for six weeks, eight weeks, and this is why the insurance company pay for those treatments because it's proven. A lot of times people come in for two visits, oh, I don't see any relief. Or you see the same <laughs> thing. Too, yeah. Right, right. Exactly. It's not, you're not going to get like relief. It's not a pill. like the gym, right? Yeah. If somebody is 300 pounds and they want to lose some weight, they go to the gym a couple of times, oh, now I'm just sore and I didn't lose any weight. Exactly. So <laughs> I haven't lost it, any it weight. I'm going to go sit and eat a repetition. bagel. <laughs> especially when it's from repetitive use. It's been years and years of trauma yeah. and damage, and then they expect one time I, I, all better. So patient education is so very important. And they also don't always stop the things that caused it in the first place while you're fixing <laughs> yeah. it. Well, so yeah, you know, they're on the computer, you know, 12 hours a day, and, wow. and that's why their wrists are bothering them. And while you're trying to rehab it or, or you know, correct their problems, they're still typing away. I'll tell you the story. Uh, I was seeing this lady, uh, copper tunnel syndrome. We worked on her wrist and wrist, and for three weeks we were doing it. And she was feeling some relief, but the symptoms tend to come back. Some relief, symptoms tend to come back. And the one day I saw her in the hallway, and she had a purse which weighed about eight pounds. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing with this purse? How you carry it all day? Oh, I have to have my purse. I got all this stuff in there. And then I worked with her purse for I told her, you cannot carry this purse. You have to switch your shoulder. <laughs> if you want this arm to get better, you gotta get, get that purse. So we went through the purse and uh, we took out some of the stuff that she doesn't need it. 
made it lighter and told her other way to carry the purse, took some pressure out of the brachial plexus, maybe this did some relief for C6 or C5 and have symptom improved. So, so in layman's terms for our, our audience too, what we said is the brachial plexus is like a bundle of nerves. Nerve, so exactly. we look at here on our <laughs> model, mm -hmm. everything comes from, from here down. The brain sits right in here, spinal cord comes through here and the nerve roots come out here. Yep. And they branch into all the peripheral nerves. So he, through here you have what's called the brachial plexus, which then goes down into the arm. Yep. And so he mentioned earlier the median nerve controls these two fingers. So for our audience, a lot of times people may have pain or numbness and tingling in their hand, but think about it and think, and really once you concentrate on it, say, oh yeah, it is just these two fingers, mm -hmm. or it is just these two fingers. And depending on which area it is, helps right. us to determine not only the diagnosis, but the treatment accordingly as well. Exactly. And so like you were saying, we see a lot of people that come in with hand pain, hand tingling. Mm -hmm. Now it's something that we want to assess the hand and the carpal bones themselves as well, but we see a lot of problems from here. And, and, and one of the biggest root. ones is not only because of the repetitive use of the typing, but as they're doing it, forward like posture. you said, yep. the yep. shoulders roll forward, it tightens the pectoral muscle, the head moves forward. And if we think about, let's say, I was holding a bowling ball here, it would be a lot easier for me to hold it here than yeah, here, here correct. right? Our head is like a bowling ball. Yep. We have a big head, we have a small neck. So the farther forward we go, the more tension and the more mm -hmm. weight mm -hmm. we're carrying the bottom of our neck and our shoulders. Correct. And, and uh, even adult human head weighs about 12 to 13 pounds. And it's just sitting here. <coughs> if you have a bowling ball of 12 pounds and just sitting here, it's going to go wherever gravity will take us or take the ball. And usually it's going forward. We always, as we grow older, the weakness of the muscle and gravity acting on you for last, if you're 80 years old, last 80 years. <laughs> Or 79 because you see this start to move exactly. forward. The, the, the more hunch, they go forward your head moves, then the more strain and the more it's going to stretch those muscles, tendons, ligaments, Extensive as tendons, well yeah. as your spinal cord. They've actually done studies on MRIs that show a forward or a head. kyphotic forward head posture can stretch the spinal cord between three to five centimeters. So I mean wow. that's, that's pretty significant. A lot of tension there. Absolutely. Wow. And I always tell people that you know when you see the seniors. It, in the nursing home that have the big hunchback, but yeah. that didn't start when they were 65 years old. Exactly. That started when they were 25 years old, over exactly. years and years. So I always encourage people to be proactive with their health and their spine. You know, mm -hmm. people start going to a dentist when they're just kids to keep their teeth healthy, but they don't think about their spine until they have yeah. a big hunch, right? So we encourage people to be proactive, do stretches at home, do exercises at home, go for regular checkups to their chiropractor get physical therapy evaluations. We encourage people to be proactive rather than wait until. And, and you guys probably shows. seen that more than I have, that um, bad posture. People come into your clinic, they're in their 70s, and <coughs> I've seen ladies, she comes in the 70s, she has kyphosis, a little bit. She want to be straight. Yes, there's things we cannot fix everything. Am but I she right? wanted you yeah. to fix her that day. Yeah, yeah we yeah. said that. Like, you, what, you can't straighten me out in one visit? I was telling the lady, you got here in 70 years. <laughs> yeah. Okay? And then you're telling me to fix all that in six weeks? It's not going to happen. What we can do, I can educate you, I can work with you, and we work the area around the spine. We cannot, once it's structurally bent, it's hard to bring it back. But what you can do, you work on the muscle around the spine, to make the, how I want to say, the area that taking her down, the process or the progression, we can slow that progression down, but not bring you all the way back like you want to be in your 20s. Because once it's gotten that bad, there's now degenerative changes. Correct. There's osteophytic <laughs> formation, which are bone spurs. The bone literally starts to melt around the edges yep. to support and, and the, the spine. And the bone mass itself has deteriorated. Uh, you know, if somebody young, their bone might be nice and healthy, but dehydration and age take the bone down. And the total mass of the bone, if you look at one vertebrae or one lumbar, has shifted over the age age play a big role in any of these rehab or and a outcomes. great way to prevent that for, for our viewers for osteoporosis the number one thing to avoid bone loss is exercise putting stress on your joints exactly. and your bones so you know be active go out for even just a brisk walk any anytime you're up weight bearing mm -hmm. um, we have different therapies uh, I'm sure you do some things like whole body vibration 
therapy where you're actually putting more stress on the bone. Correct, you guys do that very well and you guys have those machines more than uh, therapy places and it does help, help the person in a sense you're putting any resistant exercise, what it does for osteoporosis patient or arthritis or older degeneration, any resistant exercise is helpful because you not just you're building a mass, you're also strong in, uh, making your bone more stronger. A lot of people have misconception in general what exercise does, right? Where they think if I do my curls and I do my exercise, it just builds my muscles right up. Yeah. Which is true, but not true. It starts to tear down, the body rebuilds stronger. That's how it gets stronger. Correct. No different than if you, you know, rub down your hand a million times, eventually your skin is going to get stronger to to, to prevent, prevent that it. wear down, and that's exactly what happens with the body. Body with is exercise. very intelligent. It's always looking how to improve itself. <laughs> so if something's causing a problem, mm -hmm. your body is going to react and say, "We need to make this stronger." So next time, it won't cause as much damage. And, and that's I always educate my patient in the same theory that you can train your body to run the marathon, but it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in two months. It might take a year to get there, but you can train your body to adopt a new condition, and then you have endurance to run that long race. And then sometimes, you know, the body is trying to do everything properly to make itself better, to mm -hmm. improve. However, certain things like, like scar tissue, right? I cut my hand, my body's gonna build scar tissue to seal it up. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have repetitive injury and damage to joints, your body will build up scar tissue, and if you continue to have those same type of injuries, it's going to put more and more scar tissue, which eventually will limit motion. Correct. That limited motion can cause all sorts of different problems as well, because then you'll get less circulation, less mm -hmm. imbibition to the disc material, mm -hmm. and then it starts to just wear out a lot faster. So, you know, the scar tissue is there at first for a reason, but then we continue the same problems. And so it's important to, once we start to correct things, continue to keep good healthy motion to prevent the buildup of scar tissue as well. And we see that a lot in a, in a chiropractic office with, we, we call it joint adhesion, or it's a buildup of scar tissue and it causes restricted motion so the joint won't move properly. So we see this in the spine, the, the verbral misaligned, and even though they'll be able to move, they might not even notice it, but those two segments, there will be joint restriction and won't move properly. So part of the adjustment will actually not just the alignment, but also breaking up the scar tissue and adhesions. We see this in other joints in the body too, uh, like adhesive capsulitis, which is a frozen shoulder, shoulder exactly. is the, basically the same thing, the, the um, scar tissue buildup and adhesions inside the joint. You gotta get those moving, because if you don't, it just gets worse and worse and worse, and you lose the function of the joint. And even once you break the scar tissue up, you wanna make sure you keep good, healthy motion. We see well, a lot of patients properly, with it. And correct. I'm sure you see a lot of patients with that type of condition as well. The old myth, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. Right, exactly, <laughs> so, exactly. So. So, so that's for our audience at home, something very important to try to their best to keep good, healthy motion. Now, on the other side of the coin, if there is injury, if there is misalignment, if there are structural problems, it's not good to necessarily have the old adage, no pain, no gain. Walk yeah. it off. Don't <laughs> be pushing through it in injury. That's when it's important to get a consultation. Go see your doctor. Go see a physical therapist. Go see a chiropractor. We'll see an orthopedist, but it's important to get a professional to take a look at it if there is a problem, especially if there is pain and symptoms, you know, especially those ridiculous type of symptoms where there's the numbness, the tingling, the pain in the hands or the pain in the feet. It's not the, what is that website that talks about how you can diagnose yourself? Uh, WebMD. Web yeah, 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 exactly. It's not, it's people, not WebMD all yeah. the time. People are right? always asking Dr. Google what to do. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Don't, you gotta go see, uh, when you're seeing somebody face to face and just listening to them, you can find out 10 other things can be wrong that you need to fix prior to Right, that. right. When you see a symptom, uh, what happened prior to that? You, that is very important to figure out how right. we got what, there. What caused the injury? What's the mechanism Me of the injury? Exactly, and we, a lot of time we forget to listen to the patient, what they're saying because we're so busy, time, the time limitation yeah. on the patient to insurance and company and it's, all that. It's not only always just one thing too that causes it. A lot of times it'll be, you know, they might have had a physical trauma, like an injury, like a car accident, or they slipped on the ice, yeah. something like that. But a lot of times it's repetitive things too. It's the things that they do over and over, over and how over. they sit, how they sleep. So our next guest is here. We have a really interesting topic to talk about with him, uh, something called the Knee Institute. But let's kind of uh, sum up what we've talked about a little bit for the next couple of minutes for our audience. 
We talked about how it's very important to be proactive with your health rather than reactive. We talked about a few different conditions as well. We talked more about repetitive use, but you see a lot of people as well uh, with trauma, would you say? Oh, definitely. All Sports the time. injuries, car accidents, falls. Sprained ankle. Sprained ankles. Breaking a fall, breaking a shoulder, collarbone. We see that all the time, and uh, obviously the right place for that to be diagnosed is ER. But after ER, what is the next step? Follow through your regular doctor, and then go do rehab. See, go see chiropractor. And we'll see a lot of people that may have not gone to ER. They stayed home. Maybe now, they should have gone to the And year. now <laughs> yeah. a couple of weeks have gone by. And now they need to think of doing something. You know, let's say sprained ankle, they think, oh, it's not so what bad. I, yeah, what I usually see, like, the longer you wait, the farther you have to, the yes. further it takes to get better. We Look at the athletes in NFL or NBA. Why do these people get better right away? First of all, they they're get super treated athletes. First second, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they get treated right when they get injured. And they have a, a whole team of physicians and specialists. They and have right chiropractors the and PTs athletic and trainers and trainers, trainers, and trainers everybody. Even, even massage therapy. Yep. Yeah, there. absolutely. Yeah. Every NFL team now has a chiropractor right on the field. They all have a full team of, of physicians right there to take care of them instantly. So you're saying uh, if I get injured, I have to have a whole team of it would, be nice. it would be nice if you had yeah. your own team if we're also lucky. just yeah. in case you chipped off the curb, right? Exactly. Yeah. But uh, with the same token, I have half insurance. It doesn't cover everything. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> so. That's another thing. So uh, we were talking a little bit before the show. You know, it's important for people, especially seniors now, it's open enrollment to make sure to be proactive about exactly. which plan they're going to choose, which is going to give the best coverage for what they may need throughout the year. And if you don't have the information, get help from somebody, somebody sure. like your son, son-in-law, daughter, daughter-in-law, friends. Sure. Ask physician. They can tell you. Whether they're going through the exchange or time. through the company, it's important exactly. to be proactive on knowing what, Get in the right what insurance you'll plan. have. If you cannot, senior, I always educate them. If you cannot make a decision what insurance you should get, join AARP. They make a decision for you because they are negotiating. Right, right. Pick one they for are, you. <laughs> yeah, they're negotiating with the insurance company. Uh, I think what they have two million or maybe sixty million seniors in their under belt. They get you a regular, uh, better price and better plan. And if you don't know what to pick, join AARP. Let them make a decision for you. And Medicare, as well as many other health insurances, Blue Cross, Cigna, HAP, you name it. They most of these policies have coverage for both Super chiropractic nature. and for physical therapy and rehab. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times people, they're, they're not sure they don't want to go in because they're not sure if their insurance will cover it. You could always call the, the doctor or call the clinic and, and ask, say, hey, are, do you take this insurance? Do, the, do I have coverage? Uh, for for my, my office, we will do a free insurance verification for you. And right. So we've run out of time, but thank you guys both for being here today. I think we really did great. A lot of great information for our audience. So we'll see you next time on Ask the Chiropractor. We had our special guest, Noman Siddiqui with U.S. Rehab, Dr. Alex Rodnick, our co-host. And I'm Dr. Adam Rodnick out of Commerce Township, Michigan. And we'll see you next time. Stay healthy. Now, now we can just like, you know, well, the credits are rolling.